Now, to break down the, the word roots, the word immunity means to be free of a burden. You know, if you're immune to some disease, great, but maybe not others, not so great. So, <clears throat> so that, that's what the word literally means. And so what I have on this first um, slide are the categories of body's defenses against pathogens, which would be burdens to us. Um, Nonspecific means that your body will defend against any kind of foreign invader, anything that's a non-self cell. That's what non-specific means. Defend against all bad pathogens. So that first line of defense, I just put first. Those are just physical barriers <clears throat> that keeps all things out. And skin's a good sign of a good physical barrier. The mucous membranes that lines, for example, your oral cavities and other cavities. A little stomach acid, good old HCL, as we'll learn when we talk about the stomach. You can ingest a lot of things through your stomach. Um, and basically, a, a, a nice low pH will kill most things trying to enter your bloodstream through the, digest through the digestive tract. So basically, physical barrier, just keep everything out. Right. <clears throat> Skin is the best one of all those. Let's see here. All right, well, when it gets to like, second or third line of defense, whether it be specific or non-specific, you need to understand that there's um, the immune system kind of has a, a learning process. Which would be step one, recognition. You need yourself to be able to recognize self cells from non-self cells, right? Because it's non-self you want to fight. Can you recognize self versus non-self? That's the idea. Because the ability to recognize non-self, then step two in the learning process, the destructive things that follow the recognition of non-self. Destructive events <clears throat> that follow recognition of non-self. So then you have your second line of defense, which is also considered non-specific, able to recognize self in anything non-self. Basically, these are your army of phagocytes circulating inside your body. Okay. If the thing manages to get past the first line, gets past the skin, maybe you have a cut and something enters into the bloodstream, now it's in you. Okay, now you have army of phagocytes. Okay, that's how I'll summarize that list that's already given to you, macrophages, monocytes, eosinophils. Basically, those cells <coughs> circulate and can recognize anything that's non-self. Um, phagocytosis would be the mechanism of the structure. There are other things that I haven't talked about yet. Interferons, complement, I'll mention that. Uh, upcoming. Well, anyways, this is the whole, these cells have the ability to have this recognition. In case you give you one example. The macrophage. Have you ever seen me use this? That's my shorthand for macrophage, because that means phage. Now, 
they have this scavenger receptor, that's what it's called. Anything that produces recognition of this by this receptor is engulfed and is considered garbage to the body, and these cells eat it. You scavenge around and look for things that are non-cell, okay? Wait, anyway, wait, that's your army of phagocytes. We'll talk about the other two things. Now, I, I need to spend a lot of more time talking about the third line of defense. This is really the key in our defenses, um, the lymphocytes, the bees and the bees. These are kind of like the main army <coughs> of your immune process. What we'll see is, um, we'll get into the details, but just, you know, give you a prelude. Basically, the bees, A bees, basically the A bees, um, the B cells, the antibodies. The T cells, there's a subpopulation of T cells that can actually attack cells themselves, like cell to cell attack. So they're called killer cells sometimes. All right, well, anyways, for, for those to work, antigens are required. Antigens from, um, for example, from the pathogen required. Studying your figure, you'll see sometimes antigens is abbreviated AGs as opposed to ABs for antibodies. But anyways, uh, I'll tell you what antigens are. Antigens are antibody generators. You present them to the B cells and generate antibodies. So, now, I already discussed the formation of the white blood cells, so I'm going to just whiz through these slides. This discussion was a, a prior lecture, so these are basically duplicate slides where I defined the histology and function of certain white blood cells. But today I'm going to focus on... Um, Oh, wait. I didn't talk about this last time. Let me, let me note eosinophilia. I think I'd be wary of uh, a person who has a parasitic infection if I saw elevated eosinophils. This picture I took, we have a slide collection of this condition, they're hard to find. And if on a drop of blood on any given field of vision, I could see a couple few. There, 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 there. That's eosinophilia. Okay. Anyways, that condition I don't think I mentioned the last time. Lymphocytes we are going to talk about today. This is what they look like. Nothing special. But their function is, um, there's a lot to talk about. Um, okay. So let's kind of talk about chemotaxis interferon complement. So what I'm going, my approach is just to go through the non-specific defenses first. They're, they're also called the innate defenses. I like the term non-specific better. <coughs> These defend against anything that's non-self. So we'll talk about the non-specific before the specific defenses. I described them earlier is they do not distinguish one type of threat from another. The response is the same, regardless of the invading agent. And so here's the cells that we talked about that are our stable, acidic army. And, well, one of the destructive responses that follows this recognition is inflammation, the inflammatory response, where basically you vasodilate the area and you attract leukocytes via chemotaxis. And here's a figure that takes you through those steps. The example they give is Dirty nail penetrates the skin and introduces a pathogen. Now, in the picture, the pathogen are the green capsules. Okay, so that's that's the infection. Um, so, <laughs> inflammatory response. How do you know if something's infected? Well, is it puffy? Is it red? 
is, is there pus? The pus are white blood cells. It's infected. There's the white blood cells fighting it. And step one, they call it leukocytosis. Basically, whatever white blood cell you're recruiting, it has to enter the bloodstream from the bone marrow. So in this example, that's a neutrophil, so I'll just put neutrophil. In the bloodstream. Don't take for granted that you have white blood cells. They have to mature and enter the bloodstream from the bone marrow. If it's not in circulation, they can't help you, okay? <clears throat> uh, so that's important. If you, have, you actually have an appreciable amount of white blood cells. Now the next step, they're circulating. It's like they're on patrol, but they don't really fight infection unless there's an infection to be had. So you have to recruit the leukocytes um, to the area of infection. Okay. Well, in this case, it's neutrophil. I'll say recruit neutrophil to infected area. Now, they put margination. The first thing you do to recruit a neutrophil to the area, it's flowing by, but it'll roll, stick, and then stop. It'll adhere to the blood vessel where the infection is. And so I'll call that adhesion, not margination. There are adhesion molecules that you can actually measure that are produced by endothelial cells because of the infection. And they'll like basically, the ones that flow by will, will stick. Um, then diapedesis means, um, let's write that word down. Die, it means separate. Head means foot, so this means jump across. That word means jump across. So basically the neutrophils are being squeezed out through the vessel wall. Neutrophils <coughs> squeeze through vessel wall. It's a capillary wall, it's a gland. Well, how is this occurring? It's following a chemotaxis trail. That's step four. Chemotaxis. You're following a chemical gradient. So if you look at the picture, the injured tissue cells are secreting chemoattractive proteins. Those are the blue dots next to the green capsules. They're acting as a chemo, they're literally, they're like sniffing the chemotactic proteins on the other side of the vessel wall, and they're being sucked towards it. Okay, they're not attracted to the green capsules, they're attracted to the blue chemoattractic proteins. Okay, your body cells have the ability to secrete proteins that attract your white blood cells, okay? <clears throat> Neutrophils. follow a chemical gradient. They're attracted to these chemicals called chemoattractive proteins. <clears throat> I used to do an experiment as a grad student. Um, I would collect uh, culture media from cells. And it, when you collect media from cells, all their secretions are in it. And they have these chemotactic agents in it. I, I could put those in a well. I could physically put a paper membrane over it that's porous. And then I could put on top of that, uh, I could put white blood cells. And they'll just be sucked through to the bottom, right through the paper. Okay, so this really does happen. If we could do it in the lab. So those chemoattractive proteins are very important in this process. And once, but once you get that, then, I don't think they really say, you can see what's happening. Phagocytosis, that's the destructive action there. <clears throat> Phagocytosis of bacteria. Here's a picture of that happening for real. Here's a little green 
capsules being um, phagocytized by macrophage. Another mechanism of the innate or nonspecific defenses are interferons. <clears throat> you want to fight a, a virus infection, the goal is to interrupt the replication. If, an, if you succumb to a virus and you die, basically, you'll hear reported that people who die from viruses, they have millions, maybe billions of the virus in them, okay? Because of their ability to um, basically hijack cells and replicate their own genetic material. So here's how it works. Um, the viruses, they have a genetic material, RNA, and they have a special enzyme called um, reverse transcriptase, where you can go from RNA back to DNA. That's why they can hijack your cells. So what this is showing you is in host cell one, it gets infected by a virus. So what they're showing you is the infection process. The RNA goes back to the DNA, uh, DNA and uh, but anyways, that infection, it triggers the cell as a defense mechanism to switch on uh, the interferon gene. So the host one, host cell one, which is infected, produces the interferons as a result of the infection. And what you see is that the interferons stimulate host cell 2 to produce uh, antiviral proteins. Interferons stimulate cell to produce Viral proteins. That should, um, well, basically, host cell two is protected. Host cell one is not. Okay. So, but you're stopping the replication okay, in its tracks, and if, if they work, of course, you can die from a virus. Okay, so that's a case where there, there's no, there's a term in immunity called it's called correlate of immunity. It's used more by doctors. It's like person survives the Ebola outbreak. Wow, you survived. What did your body produce, something like this, that helped you survive when thousands of them died? Okay, you know, and so it's their job to figure it out. It doesn't always work, but when it does work, this cell is protected. This cell is not. It's already been infected. Okay? It didn't have the benefit of the antiviral proteins. <clears throat> All right, another uh, nonspecific defense is called complement. And I like the name. Because it kind of tells you the function of these molecules. Now, complement refers to this set of defenses, non-specific defenses, complements both specific defenses and non-specific defenses. So complement complements both specific and non-specific defenses. Um, how the pathway kicks off, well, 
here are the mechanisms here. Let's go with this one. This is the classical pathway when antibodies coat some target pathogen. Well, they don't really have a picture of this. All right, so you have a um, pathogen. And let's say there's an antibody that is specific. Antibodies are part of your specific defenses. They coat this pathogen. When antibodies coat a pathogen, it's called oxidization. Um, the term is here. Codes, pathogen surfaces. Oh, well, let me explain that. Uh, Sonization. This is how complement complements specific defenses. ABs, co pathogen. Now, what happens is, in this antibody, <clears throat> the forked part is the specific region. But the tail is a non-specific region. And what happens is, the non-specific region bumps into complement, like for example, C3B component. And when that happens, it kind of takes a ride to the pathogen. Fixation, complement fixation, when, when you bump into it and you just kind of like fix it to the pathogen. So that's complement fixation. You're fixing complement to the pathogen. And what you're doing is you're increasing um, <clears throat> the chance that you'll get MAC attack. Now, there's other cascades that happen here. I'll just have you know, MAC attack means membrane attack complex, where you have a complex of complement proteins that punch a hole in the pathogen and it'll be destroyed. So, Can cause MAC attack. The yeah. destructive uh, result is that the pathogen um, is destroyed by lysis. Does it always cause MAC attack or only sometimes? Um, it should cause it all the time if it happens. I mean, look at all those molecules. So, I mean, what are the chances that all those molecules will do it? I, I, I'm not sure, but it should. Okay. Lysis of pathogen. Is there another question? Well, anyways, this oxidization is like complementing the specific reaction. Okay? Because, like, you're fixing complement using the antibodies. The antibodies are part of that specific response. Now, for the non specific defenses, Basically, I'll just say complement enhances inflammation. Now I just call what inflammation is, so that's all I'll say. Compl
Hawkins and Hansons. Information. For those other ones, the complement and optimization of those non-specific defenses or those specific? Coding of antibodies, specific. But when you fix complement, it's like specific and non-specific working together. Complement is part of your non-specific defense. Okay. It's using the antibodies to get a ride to the pathogen in this example, opsonization. Because opsonization, you coat antibodies, other things can do it. You could bind it up and <clears throat> a macrophage could come along. A neutrophil could come along. Okay. Antibodies don't destroy pathogens. They're not the murderers. They're accessories to murder. Okay, they just bind it up, hold it, and something else will come along and destroy it. Maybe complement. Yeah. So let's talk about um, the B cell and the T cell mediated immunity to get into more of the, the specific or adaptive defenses. And so a little bit of history here. Back in the 50s, experiments were done. Um, you know any experiment, you gotta get a gotta get a good animal model. It's, it's tricky. Well, From mice are used commonly. What they did was they, um, I don't know if you knew this, you can kind of like cook up any kind of protein or antigen in the lab. You can inject it into a small animal and your immune system should respond to it because it's a foreign invader, okay? Normal immune response. Well, if you want to study immunity, what you got to do is, well, one way you can do it is you can knock out their immunity. So they say irradiate, exposed to high energy beams, um, that'll zap out cell function. Now, you don't know which cell <coughs> confers immunity, but just get it to where when you inject them with an antigen, they don't have an immune response. That's your model, okay? Because what you could do is then take your um, irradiated animals. You can start adding back cells that you know you're adding. So give them the antigen, give them lymphocytes. Oh, look, you restored it. They're not supposed to have immune response because you zapped them. And then, you know, as a negative control, give them some other cell type, anything, like, I don't know, connective tissue cells, something. No immune response. You, you kind of rule out which cells don't have immune function, which cells do, it's the lymphocytes. All right, so what we know is that in specific defenses, they respond to a particular bug, but they're ineffective against anything else. Okay, I'd use another analogy. It's like, I don't know, a cop on patrol. You know, he's looking for any kind of bad guys, just looking for trouble. What kind of trouble? Any trouble. Compare that to like a detective who's assigned a particular case, some crime, one particular crime. So he goes out and he, he looks for one particular bad guy. Not, not any bad guy, just, you know. So that's kind of like this where you have all these different clones, millions of them. And maybe one or two or three clones are selected to fight one particular bug you caught last flu season. And if you ever catch that bug again, you're not going to get sick. Okay. Of course, you'll never know it. Maybe you ever had an experience where it's like it feels like you're getting sick, mm -hmm. but you wake up the next morning, you're okay. Maybe it was that. Maybe you had the memory cell from last time against that particular bug. But if you catch a different bug, you know, it's not always think about the CDC because like every year, how do they come up with the flu vaccine? They got to figure out what everyone had last flu season. They have to try to predict what everyone's going to get next flu season, and then they got to send it out. So every year, we should get we should we should get our flu shot. Okay. Doesn't mean you're not going to get sick, but you're helping your chances that you're protected. All right, so it requires exposure, either you know, from a classmate, from a coworker, um, or deliberate. You you get a vaccination, which has you know some kind of inactive component where you're going to get the antigen and the response, but hopefully you won't get sick. I mean, you can still get sick from being vaccinated. You can have a reaction. Okay, but you know this. That thing's 
Everyone should get vaccinated today for everything. They do work. I mean, it's in the news now. There are populations of people who don't get vaccinated, and what happens? The bugs came back. Bugs we haven't seen for de generations are coming back. And people are like, well, I, I don't want to get vaccinated. People don't get that anymore. That bug's gone. It's not gone. Those little molecules are still there. Just no one's getting sick because everyone's vaccinated. And if you're not vaccinated, so those bugs are going to infect certain populations where, hey, you know. And um, <clears throat> I'm a big fan of vaccination. <clears throat> it's a public health issue. I know people have different opinions on parents you know, vac vaccinating their kids, but just from my experience and study, um, vaccination works. And everyone should do it if it's available to you. Okay? It'll really help our public health problems. These cells are what we're doing. When we get vaccinated, we're like stimulating clones of these cells and growing them up in our body and protecting ourselves, no matter where we go in life. You go out, unless you live in a plastic bubble, you're gonna get sick, okay? And what doesn't kill you makes you stronger because you're gonna get some memory cells for the next time, okay? Okay, so B limbs. Um, well, there's all different kinds of B limbs, so let me define the subpopulations. B cells, B limbs, whatever you want to call them. The B stands for bursa, from birds. I think that's where they first studied them. Let's just go with B. Um, so we know what lymphocytes look like, right? They got, you know, not much to look at in the scope. They have a little room of cytoplasm, large, round, dark nuke. <clears throat> they just circulate. Um, what happens is they, they have membrane receptors and these membrane receptors they're actually antibodies but they're just membrane bound okay, that's what I drew in blue and they can they can buy free antigens in your body Bind free AGs, you know, wh wherever they may be. Say, I don't know. Okay, let me use let me use red, the red balls, antigens. Let's say it's non-self pathogen, and it binds this particular clone. This, this becomes activated, becomes stimulated, and this clone of a million clones that found a specific uh, foreign bug will then proliferate, okay, into different cell types. Proliferate clone. And some of these cells may become plasma cells, which are your antibody producing factors. So we should make the cell bigger, because there's no cytoplasm here. You increase the cytoplasm to get all your cell-making machinery, you know, like ER, Golgi, all that stuff. And you produce antibodies and secrete them into the bloodstream. They're not membrane-bound. You secrete the antibodies into circulation. Okay, antibody factories. Secrete ADs. And then you're circulating. Get your antibody tighter up to this particular bug. And these antibodies can fight it by binding it up. Okay, so you got your plasma cells, the antibody factories. That's one of the population. On a drop of blood, you usually don't see it, these cells, because they're, they're usually in the connective tissues fighting infection when they're stimulated. Um, okay, memory B limbs. So some of these that proliferated into plasma cells, some just stick around and become memory B loops, memory B cells. A memory B cell 
and the first B cell that was first stimulated is the memory cells are more sensitive. So if they ever see the same antigen again, the same pathogen, they'll mount a faster, stronger response. You probably won't get sick. Which one is um, the one that you said, the, well, whatever you just said, more sensitive? This one. Sorry. Memory B cells. Memory B cell. yeah. If you want the memory B cell, they're very effective. Mount a faster, stronger response if you're infected by the same pathogen a second time. If you're infected by the same pathogen a second time. I mean, that's pretty much a restatement of being immune to something. Right? You got sick the first time, but hey, you got the memory B cell, you got sick the second time. So they got those two subpopulations, the memory cells and the positive cells. And the T lamps have different subpopulations. The T stands for thymus, that's where they mature. Now, it's too hard to draw the whole process. There's many different cell populations. I'll just define it for that. The T cell, you have the most important ones are the T helper cell, TH. Helper T cell. Also known as CD4 cells because there, there's a membrane protein that helps lock in the uh, Activation, I'll get into that. CD4 cell ultimately. Um, just to tell you how important they are, the HIV virus, the virus that causes AIDS, it obliterates the CD4s. So if you don't have these cells, basically you have AIDS. You can't mount an immune response. That's what AIDS is. Acquired immunodeficiency. And so these cells are it. When there's only one cell that's most important, I would say it's these cells. Okay, you also have the TC stands for a cytotoxic T cell. Um, they used to be called the, the killer T cells. I used that term earlier today. Oh, anyways, hand-to-hand -hand combat. They, it's a cell that can attack another, say, for example, virus-infected cell. Can attack virus-infected cells. T regulatory cells. Now the T regulatory cells, I won't mention what uh, mention much. Sometimes they're called CD25. Oh, I forgot. The, the, the killer cells, also called CD8 cells. T regulatory, also called T25 cells. Sometimes they're called T suppressor cells. That's their function. They kind of. Um, Put the brakes on, on your immune response so you don't overshoot your immune response and just start attacking yourself. Okay, like for example, if you have a problem with the, this subpopulation, you have autoimmune problems, you have hyper allergy problems. Okay, so think of these as kind of a suppressor or a break on your immune system. My wife the other day, my wife's Korean. 
Koreans are bizarre. <laughs> they have this snail mucin that they use for your face for hydration. She goes, hey, try this. And I put it on. She goes, oh, it's 96% snail mucin. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I think that night I had an allergic reaction. <laughs> allergic to the snail mucin. You know, I was up all night, had to take medicine, and hopefully these kicked in for me, but I didn't catch much sleep that night. But anyways, that's what they are. You have an allergic response. You, you could take medicine, but you have cells that help put the brakes on your allergic reaction. Okay. <clears throat> Her friends down the street are Korean, and, uh, well, the white face, my friend. He's like, yeah, my wife has that too. <laughs> my great wife was the only one that has the snail music. That must be a fit. Okay, anyways, let's get back to B cell mediated community. All right, so here's the idea that I presented earlier. This response requires antigens that be presented. Requires exposure to antigens. AGs. Yeah, it's up. <laughs> now this um. This antigen presents three different antigenic determinants. So that would represent, say, three clones of B cells that secrete antibody A, B, and C. So, so the more antigenic determinants that are presented to your body is, well, the more chance you have to provoke some kind of response. Okay. Maybe one clone, maybe three clones, maybe more. That, that's what makes it specific. The antibodies are specific to the AGs, and that's what you get vaccinated with an activated um, virus or pathogen or whatever, but that has the antigens that your cell cells can recognize. Yeah, you're getting the shot in the arm, and th isn't it sore? It's not the shot. I mean, a needle's very small, right? You, you think, oh, did she really stabbed me, didn't she? It's not. It's, you're having an immune response. That's why you get the soreness. <clears throat> Uh, here's the subpopulations we talked about. You know, the antibodies, you would study this in a, a molecular class. The, the diversity is tremendous. There's a, a thing called somatic recombination. You don't have to know it, but you can want to look it up. This is why you can have so many different kinds of antibody clones because of this. It's the simplest ammunition of the immune response. Because of all this antibody diversity, genes um, for antibodies, when they were shuffled, you could regenerate. B cells, and you could get 10 to the 11th power different numbers of clones. Yeah, that, that's how remarkable it is. That's why you could cook up anything in the lab, inject something with it, inject it into something, and I mean, there's a good chance one of these is specific for it. Okay, so this reshuffling is very important for the antibody diversity. Antibody targets, well, bacteria, molecules in extracellular environments, basically somewhere in your body. And we talked about this before, where the specific fragment is the forked end of the non-specific fragment, which can that bump into complement is on the other end. <clears throat> there are different classes of immunoglobulins. Sometimes A, Bs are called IGs. IgG is the commonest. So let me look that up. Hold on a second. They represent 80% um, 
of the immunoglobulins. Is that a G or a 6? Oh, sorry. G. I G G. Oh, G. Little G capital G. There you go. Sorry about that. Sometimes my G's look like 6's, sometimes my Q's look like V's. So let me know if you can't read something. Thank you. Anyways, these are the ones that can cross the placenta. So that's for females. Also for females, IgA, those are the class of antibodies that are in breast milk. Just to give you a couple examples of the different subclasses, but I won't get into all of them. Uh, just to let you know, there are different classes of Igs, immunoglobulins, or antibody classes. Okay. Remember what I said about them? They're the accessories for murder. They're not the murderers. It'll increase the chance that a real destructive property will fall. So um, here's my kind of mapped out the board earlier. Look at the top. How many clones do they give you in this example? based on what we've been talking about. Three, the green, the blue, the light blue, whatever, they represent three clones. And this is a specific defense to a particular bug. In this example, the red balls stimulate the middle clone. And this one is proliferated into plasma cells, or antibody factory, and this one hangs around until next time. If you get infected, infected a second time, here's a primary infection, secondary infection, by the same bug, <coughs> you'll mount a faster, stronger response. And they try to show that to you by drawing more plasma cells and more memory cells. Another way to look at that same concept is um, graph form. They call it antibody um, titer or concentration uh, on the x-axis and exposure time, days on the y-axis. First infection, you probably get sick. It takes a while to get your antibody tighter up and it goes down. And say you get sick again a few weeks later, it's a good example. Like if you have kids and you keep getting each other sick, yeah. you should keep passing it around. Uh, well, if you get infected by the same bug a second time, you shouldn't get sick. Okay? But we know that doesn't happen. There could be several bugs in there. If you're exposed to another bug, the first time is the same response. You only amount a faster, stronger response a second time to the same bug. Okay. All right. Well, um, so like I said, antibody actions, they just bind it up. Maybe they fix complement. Okay. And fixing complement is the thing that can lead to lysis and be the destroyer. Maybe you can sop it up in precipitation or agglutination, like we talked about in blood typing, or what they call it neutralization. I used another word today, opsonization, not on this figure, where you just coat antibodies. Um, the basic idea here is you're just binding these things up to enhance the chance that a real destructive thing will happen, like phagocytosis or inflammation. Remember, they're not the murderers, they're just kind of like the accessories uh, to prevent. I don't know why. I've heard that analogy and it's stuck in my head and I can't get it out of my head. But hopefully you get the point. Um, now, when you have acquired immunity, that means you're either getting the B cell or you're either getting the immunoglobulin. So let me define what's meant by this different kinds of acquired immunity. category of acquired immunity called actively acquired. Or passively. Actively um, is when you get the memory cell. Okay, the memory B cell or whatever memory cell. You get the memory cell. Passively means you're receiving antibodies. Now, antibodies are proteins, they're not cells. So they can circulate. Well, a good example is like when you are prescribed antibiotic, antibiotics, I mean, how often do you have to take them? A couple, few times a day? For how long? 
Yeah, but that's about how long they last. You gotta take it multiple times a day because that's the hours that they spend circulating. And if you've taken it every day for a certain amount of days, I mean, that's how their lifespan, not very long. Receive A, Bs. Okay, well, that's what I say here is, your immune system, when you um, get actively stimulated to acquire immunity, you're either getting sick or getting vaccinated. Right? Now, your immune system is responding to it, and you'll have the memory cell for next time. So passively, for whatever reason, you're not getting the memory cell, but you're, you're receiving somehow, some way, antibodies. So let me give you the subcategories of receiving actively acquired immunity versus passive. So for active, they got naturally and artificially acquired. They're just out in the world and get sick from a coworker or something. Someone sneezes on you and you know, something like that. You just out in the world and you get sick. Okay. I always like to tell students, now that you know this, Next time you sneeze on someone, don't apologize. Say, you'll thank me later, you're getting a memory cell out of this. <laughs> of course, I mean, that's not how we act in society, so don't do that. <laughs> okay, the, the artificially acquired. Hopefully, you get a shot in the arm and you'll have an immune response without getting sick. Okay. If you have a newborn, they have a very um, regimented scale, like two days, two weeks, two months, you're just getting vaccinated. Um, okay, let's see. So for the passively one, I just get the ABs naturally. For example, from nursing mom. That's a good example. Baby's getting ABs through the breast milk. I said some can cross the placenta. They're just getting them from mom in this example. Or artificially acquired. Usually, when you gotta go to the doctor and they drop a bag of wide spectrum ABs on you, you're probably close to death. You only do it in emergency situations. So a good example is like um, the snake bit patient. You get snake bit. I just saw that movie, True Grit. They had to chop her arm off. But anyways, if you can save a person uh, to prepare, like say you live in Arizona, and that, that's common, so maybe the clinics want to be prepared for snake bit patients. Prior, what you do is you take some venom, a little bit, you inject it into a small animal. I don't know exactly the procedure for this. I figure. Let's figure out how much will kill the small animal, then back it off just a little bit. And then maybe they stay alive. You collect the snake antisera from this animal. Because you figure, remember it's sera, so you don't need the clotting factors. You, you figure the antibodies are in there. and just kind of store that on the shelf. The shelf is, you know, Keep it on shelf, and then give to snake bit patient to help them. Just give them the ABs just to stop the neurotoxin, whatever it is. Uh, this is a good spot for a break. When we come back from break, we'll get into the T cells a little more. We'll talk about them. Come back at 11 20. 15 minutes. <laughs>